for just local subnet discovery, but certainly on an internal network, um, or depending on the scenario, this could come, uh, come in handy to know. And I haven't seen this really used at all, but that's again, the, the version four of the framework just came out of beta uh, less than a month ago. So this may be something we see down the road. So that's sort of the basics of obtaining metadata. The real, uh, the, the, the key to attacking these web servers is not so much getting the metadata, in some cases it is, but really understanding how to talk and manipulate to these, these different endpoints. So I'm gonna run through three scenarios, and I've got a demo lined up for each scenario. Uh, hopefully, time permitting, we can get through all of them. Um, the first is gonna be a Silverlight client service that consumes a WCF web service. Uh, the second scenario is going to be just some quirky stuff around um, what's called the WCF duplex bindings. And then the third scenario is using WS security, which is the web service security standard that allows for things like message encryption and so forth. So the first scenario is a Silverlight client service. Um, starting with Silverlight version 3, there's pretty good support for WCF out of the box. Um, if you're in Visual Studio and you're creating a Silverlight project that needs to consume a web service, or if you're creating a, uh, a, a WCF RIA uh, service, it's automatically going to use a custom binding that goes over HTTP or HTTPS, but uses the binary message encoding. And the way you can tell that you're looking at a message bi uh, binary message encoding, other than the fact that it's gonna look like garbage if you see it in, uh, in a packet sniffer or in a proxy server, is through the content type header. You're gonna have either msbin1 or soap msbin1. It's essentially, the only difference here is the, there's two different proprietary protocols that they're using. One is just binary XML, the other one's binary soap. Um, these are, they have published the specs. You can Google the, uh, the spec and, and or on MSDN, they've actually published the spec for it. Uh, but it is a proprietary protocol, so that's not to say that that spec can't change from version to version. So if we look at our vanilla use case here, typically most of us that are familiar with attacking uh, a, a web, some web-based applications are gonna use something like a, an intercept proxy, like Burp, for example, to uh, intercept all the data between the client and the service. So the problem that we're going to encounter here is that Burp does not support this binary message encoding. It's very similar to if you're testing a, uh, a Flex application and they're doing the, uh, the flash remoting stuff. Um, the, the message body is going to end up being binary, and if you try to edit it, it's not going to be serialized properly, and it's going to cause the, uh, the other side to choke. So I'm just going to show you an example of what this looks like in a, uh, in a browser. Uh, this is just a sample application that I've got here. Um, with a login page. This is Silverlight. I'm going to go ahead and enable, and the screen resolution is really small on here, so hopefully you'll be able to see. The good news is I'm running the same resolution here, so I'll be able to tell if you can't see it. Um, I'm going to point it towards a, uh, a burp proxy, and I'm just going to go ahead and try to log in with the username and password and hit the submit button here. And what's going to happen is, um, Again, it's kind of hard to see at the bottom here, but this is actually the message body. Um, you can actually see some text in there. However, you'll see some non-printable characters here. And if I actually try to edit this, so let's say I try to, um, let me just go to the, oh, here we go, much better view. If I try to go and change the, uh, the, the password that I entered in here, and then I forward it to the web service, um, what's going to happen is I'm actually going to get a, uh, I, I get a 200, but you can see here I've got a, a formatting exception that gets thrown here because it wasn't able to de deserialize that message. So this is the first major problem you're going to encounter here is that it, you can't edit any of the values that are going back and forth here with, with, with most of the proxies out there. Now, initially I did some research into looking at different options for this, and it turns out that Fiddler, which is a, a, another fairly popular um, intercepting proxy for, for Microsoft that runs on Windows, does have two inspectors, which is kind of their version of a plugin, that support binary XML. The problem is they're both read-only. So while you can view the data, it'll deserialize the message, you can't actually change the message. And I'm not the, an expert on Fiddler, but I, I contacted one of the guys that wrote one of these inspectors, and they, they seem to think that um, or they told me that it was a limitation of the Fiddler API, uh, that it can only do read-only. So I'm not sure if that's a limitation of Fiddler or not. But the, the, the long and short of it is that this may make it easier to read that data, but you can't change it. And from an attack perspective, that's not very useful. So the only solution for this was really just to, to, to whip something up 
to, uh, to fix the issue. Burp, as you know, has a, a pluggable architecture. So I created a Burp plugin that essentially just intercepts these requests looking at the content type and then hands it off to a, a .NET DLL that actually deserializes that data, shows it to us, and then reserializes it and passes it off to the, uh, to the web service. Um, those of you interested in, in, in Burp, those are the different uh, in the interface hooks that the uh, plugin uses. The plugin's available for free download on our website along with the source code. Just to give you an example of what it would look like, that same exact request that we just um, issued, you can see here, we got a timeout because I didn't forward the response. But if I go ahead and switch this over to a second instance of Burp running on 8282 with um, the plugin running, and I'll go ahead and resubmit. Just make sure intercept is on. I'll go ahead and resubmit that login request. And what you'll have here is you can actually see this is now, this specific endpoint is using binary XML. So you can see we've deserialized it and it's regular just plain XML now that I can actually clearly read the different elements and the values there and edit them as well and forward that off to the web service. And what's going to happen here is you'll notice that the, the response is still binary, and I'll talk about why in a second. But once I forward that on to the, uh, to the Silverlight client, it tells me username or password is incorrect. So this now gives us um, the ability to edit that data on the fly. So we've now sort of eliminated that binary message format as, a, uh, as an obstacle for, uh, for manipulating this traffic. Now, just a side note, you'll notice there that the response was still binary. Um, the reason for this is that if you look at the two hooks that we're using on the burp interface to, to do our encoding and decoding, um, one of them in, gets invoked before you edit the, 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 re the request, the other one gets invoked when you, uh, after you edit it. The difference is on the way back, they both hit before you edit and not after. And this again, it's a limitation of the burp API. Um, I've been, I've, I've emailed back and forth with the guy that wrote burp. He's definitely aware of this issue and has sort of roadmapped this as, as adding another interface method to re-encode data on the way back to the browser. But for now, the only workaround is to just chain two of these proxies together. So what you can do is you can just chain two instances of burp together. One will intercept and decode the uh, requests. The other one will intercept and decode the responses. And then between the two, you'll have the ability to edit responses. The only real reason you'd need to edit a response is just to uh, maybe to trick the Silverlight client into doing something, uh, enabling a button or something like that. Um, or in, in some cases, as you'll see in a few minutes, sometimes if you have a lot of that binary data, it's hard to read. So there could be situations where, uh, where you want to do this. That's the only workaround I know of um, at this point, but it is effective. So another thing to be aware of with respect to uh, WCF and especially when it comes to Silverlight is there's a new sort of framework that's come out that Microsoft has released called uh, RIA Data Services. It used to be .NET RIA Data Services. Now it's WCF RIA Data Services. Uh, essentially, all this is, it's, a, it's sort of a rapid development framework for uh, building rich Silverlight applications and the, specifically, the RIA data service component actually allows the developer to very easily expose the data access layer to the Silverlight client through web services, specifically through WCF services. And they call these domain service classes. So this is sort of the GUI that you get in Visual Studio. And, and, and one of the themes I think that you'll see when you start uh, looking at a lot of this stuff is that while Microsoft has done a lot to really make sure everything is locked down by default, so you write a vanilla class, for, you know, by default the class doesn't expose anything, there's nothing turned on by default. However, Visual Studio automatically turns everything on by default. So it's, you know, to some extent they've come a long way in making sure things are, are secure by default, but then they've sort of undone a lot of that because Visual Studio makes it so easy to turn all this stuff back on and actually in many cases it's on by default. So if you were to, uh, to, to take one of your uh, .NET data entities within Visual Studio and you want to expose it to the Silverlight client, all you do is you create one of these domain service classes. By default, the enable client access checkbox is turned on, so that means it's remotely accessible. Um, there's an option there that says enable editing. So by default, this is not actually checked, but by default, it'll, it'll expose a method to dump the results of any given table or series of tables 
out to the client. When you check off the enable editing box, it actually generates methods to create, update, and delete all of those entities as well. And again, unfortunately, there's no authentication by default. There's no author 